major and minor conductors. So today we will discuss the first important component in the RPD is major conductor. So major conductor has three uh, major functions. First, it is un unified the major part of the processes. As you can see on this arrow, the major conductor is a number one and is connected all from right to the left. The second is to distribute the applied force through the, the arch to the tooth or the tissue. The third is to minimize the torque to the tissue. So when we place the major connector, we should uh, notice three important things. First, it should be free of mo uh, movable tissue. The second, it should avoid gingiva tissue impingement. The third, the bony and soft tissue prominence should be avoided during placement and removable. So basic to say, when you place the major connectors, it should be free from the oral tissues and doesn't disturb the oral environment. In the textbook, it, given, it was given nine different characteristics for the major connector. So for the first one, it should be made from alloy compatible to the oral tissue. The second, the major connector should be rigid and provide cross arch stability. From three to six, actually is talk about when you have a major connector, it should not disturb or interfere with the oral environment, like tongue, soft tissue, ridge, or parietal fold. The seventh is that to say the major connector do not contribute to retention or trapping of food particles. Remember, we just only have the right retainer to provide retention. And eight, it should be minimize rotation tendons in function. And the last one is to contribute to the support of the processes. So how could we avoid a gingiva tissue impingement? So remember, when you design the maxilla and mandible, if you're not covered over the tooth, that those major connectors should be away from the tissue. And we have a specific number to require it. So on the maxilla, the major connector to the tooth distance should at least have six millimeters. On the mandible, it should at least to have three to four millimeters. On the textbook, it was writing in four millimeters, but in reality, or in the other textbook, sometimes it was mentioned three. So you just need to remember, maxilla is six, mandible is three to four millimeters. So let's talk about what we can use in the mandible for the major connector. Actually, we have six different types. One is a lingual bar, second is a lingual plate, the third is sublingual bar, the fourth is lingual bar with a single bar, or we also call continuous bar, the fifth is the single bar, or the sixth is a labial bar. The difference between the lingual bar and the sublingual bar just uh, depends on its locations, which we will discuss later. So let's talk about the lingual bar first. So lingual bar, when you do a cross section, it looks like half pear shape, and for its size, is six gauge. And when we place the lingual bar we should notify where we should put inferior and superior boulder. So for inferior boulder locations, it should prevent the tissue impingement during the normal activities of mastication, swallowing, speaking, or licking the lips. And you also need to be located as far inferior as possible to avoid interference with the resting tongue and trapping of food substance. However, for the superior boulder locations, it should be three to four millimeters away from the free jaw margins, also to prevent the gingiva tissue impingement. 
We also have a lingual plate. When you place the lingual plate, the upper border should follow the natural curvature of the suprasingual surface of the tubes, and should not be located above the middle third of the lingual surface. However, it also needs to be covered the interproximal space to the contact point. So as you can see, eventually it will look like a scallop shaped. Also, the lingual plate does not in itself serve as indirect retainers. Remember, when we talk in the last lectures, we talk about that we need to know where's the focal line and where's the indirect retainer. When you look at the focal lines, for example, on the slide, you can see a yellow line. That's two posterior rest seat, so we connect it as a focal line, and something in the front will be the indirect retainer. However, the lingual plate, even the location is in front of the focal line, it still not be considered as the indirect retainer. Remember, we talk about a lot of times. We say the indirect retainer just only could be the rest. So if you don't place a rest, just only a lingual plate, they will not be able to consider as an indirect retainer. It should be very careful when you define where is your indirect retainer. So we already now we have lingual bar and lingual plate. So how do we select it? So first of all, you should measure from the free jaw margin of the tooth. To the slightly elevated mouth floor with the periodontal probe, so you will ask patient to move the tongue up, so all the mouth floor will be lifted, and then you use the periodontal probe to measure from the mouth floor to the free jaw margins. And here you should remember this magic number: seven or eight millimeters. So if you have seven or eight or more. Then you will likely to choose the lingual bar. If you less than those numbers, then you have to choose the lingual plate. So why we say the magic number is seven to eight millimeters? Remember, we said that the mandible tooth joint from margin to the superior border of the lingual bar should be three to four millimeters. To prevent the gingival impingement. Also, when we consider about the rigidity of the major connectors, the proper height of the bar should be four millimeters. So, if you count both together, then you will know you will at least need seven to eight millimeters. So, in most of the cases, when you measure from the free jaw margin of the tooth to the mouth floor, is over seven to eight millimeters. In most cases, you would like to choose the lingual bar because it can provide three different functions. First, it can provide self cleaning because you, your major connector is not covered to the tooth, so the tongue and the saliva can provide the self cleaning functions to prevent the periodontal disease. The second is about the comfort, because the size of the lingual bar is less than the lingual plate, so it's a bit lighter, and also because of the locations, it will provide less disturbance to the tongue, so patient will feel much comfortable. The third is about the gingival health, because we the lingual bar is not touching the free jaw margins, so it will not affect the superficial blood supply, which will prevent. The possible gingival recessions. However, sometimes even the distance is over seven to eight millimeters. We will still need to choose the lingual plate. First, in the class one situations with excessive vertical resorption of a residual ridge, in these situations you can image that the posterior support from the ridge is weaker, so. That the partial dentures will easier to have a rotation. So when it has a rotation, you want something in the front can have some support. So you will need to use the lingual plate over the tooth to provide some support when the RPD have a horizontal rotation.
The second is about the sprinting effect. Even we said we don't want to choose the periodontal involved or periodontal health、mm, worst tools as our abutment, but in some cases you still need to use that. So in those、uh, situations, you would like to to use a lingual plate to provide the sprinting effect, so you can stabilize the periodontal weakened anterior teeth. The third is talk about the future tooth addition. So the same, when you use a periodontal weakened anterior teeth, you might expect that the prognosis of those teeth are less than normal. So patient might lose the tooth earlier than you expected. When patient lost the tooth, then when you want to add the tooth on the existing removable partial dentures, then you will need to use the lingual plate because the framework is close to the tooth. So you are easier to add the material over that. The lingual bar is too away from the tooth. You are not easier to capture the tooth or hold the dental base material. We also have one variation of the lingual plate. It's called interrupted lingual plate. So this is used when you need to use a lingual plate. However, patients and two teeth have some spacing. So this design can prevent the metal showing between the tooth, but still will be reacted as a lingual plate. So we already discussed the most two common、uh, design for the mandibular major connector. One is the lingual bar. One is the lingual plate. Let's talk about the other non-common design. The first is the sublingual bar. The sublingual bar is also looks like a bar. However, because its location is more close to the mouth wall, so that's why we call sublingual bar. It's lining over and parallel to the anterior floor of the mouth. And because its locations, so sometimes if patient have a lingual toroid or the high attachment of a lingual finans or the mouth for. It's so easier to have interference. That、uh, those are the contraindications to use a sublingual bar. And when you design a sublingual bar, you should be very careful to design where it is is located, because if you have any interference to the oral environment, that the removal partial dentures stabilities will be affected. That's why we said this is not a common design. We also have a lingual bar and a singular bar, or the singular bar. Those two are also called the continuous bar. The reason why we don't like to use the lingual bar and the singular bar is because the space between the lingual bar and the singular bar will easier to trap the food. Also, patient will easier to feel the space between those two bars, so the comfort is not very good enough. So for the single bar, compared to the lingual bar and the single bar, this design may reduce the possibility of a food entrapment because underneath the lingual bar, there's no other component, so it will not easier to entrap the food. However, look at the pictures. You can see the single bar is pretty small and limited over the tooth surface. So consider about the rigidity of the major connector. This design. May not provide adequate rigidities, which is a contraindication to the framework design. So, followed by those two reasons, that these two design is not a common design for the mandibular major connector design. We also have a labial bar design. When patient have a severe lingual inclined anterior teeth. Means that on the lingual side you have a huge tissue and the tooth undercut, so you are not able to place the lingual plate or lingual bar over those area. Or sometimes when patient have a mandible toroid but have some、um, general、uh, health issues, so you are not able to provide the surgical removal procedures, then you might consider to use a labial bar. However, we have some contraindication to use a labial bar. The first. Is when patient have a poor oral hygiene. The second is that if patient have 
a shallow buccal or labial vestibule or a high attachment of a labial fragment, these cases are not a good uh, candidate for labial bar. However, the most common reason we don't like to use the labial bar is for aesthetic. Think about that. When patients smile, the labial bar will showing all the way around. So, most of patients may not uh, accept these designs in the mouse. So, eventually, this design is not a common design for the mandibular major connectors. So we already mentioned the mandibular major connector choice, and let's take a look for the maxilla choice. We also have six different types for the maxilla. One is a single parietal strap, the second is a parietal plate, the third is U-shaped parietal, also what's called whole shoe type, the fourth is single single parietal bar, the fifth is anterior and posterior parietal strap, and sixth is anterior posterior parietal bar. So if if you look at its design, it kind of like you have one single bar strap or plate, or you can design anterior posterior strap and the bar. And when you say bar, strap, plate, actually they are divided by the width. The bar should be have 4 to 8 millimeters. The strap should be have 8 to 12. If you design a plate, that should be over 12 millimeters. So if you draw a design over the 8 millimeters, for example, if you draw something over 10 millimeters on then the maxilla basically you are saying you are designing the strap, not the bar. So these numbers should be followed. So let's take a look. First is a single parietal strap. Basically, it was common to be used in the candy class three cases. The candy candy class three means that it's the two spore case. So when you have a bilateral two supported prosthesis, particularly when the dentals area are located posteriorly, then you will um, majorly use single parietal strap. The second com the second common uh, design we used is anterior and posterior parietal strap. So this design is used in almost any maxillary removable partial denture design, especially when you, the patients have maxillary toroids, because the opening in the center, the window, can prevent this major connector to touch the maxillary toroid. And when you place the posterior parietal strap, remember, for the strap, the minimum width will need to be eight. So eight to twelve millimeters will be the requirement for the parietal for the strap width. And when you place the posterior parietal connectors, you should be located as far as posterior to prevent the interference with the tongue. But you also doesn't want to place the posterior parietal connectors posterior borders over the five plane line because you will interference when the pipe movement. We also have a U-shaped parietal connectors, which we also we call the whole shoe type. In the textbook, this design was be mentioned the least desirable of maxillary major connector, and was be provided by three reasons. The first. It was lack of rigidity compared with the other design. So some people believe that this kind of design will induce the torque or directly the lateral force to the bum and tooth. The second, this design be considered to fail to provide good support and permit impinge 
movement of underlying tissue. The third, when we want to provide rigidities, then we will need to increase the volume of the metal. And when we increase the thickness or the volume of the metals, then sometimes it will be considered to disturbance to the tongue movement. However, in the past, most of the cases have a large parietal toroids. Then this design is common to be used. I just want to say something or notify you something different here is that even in the textbook it was say this U-shaped parallel connectors or whole shoe type is the most least desirable design, which means that you shouldn't choose this kind of design. But in the daily practice, it's very common to be used. Because when we get more improved of the material and the connector fabrication procedures, actually the strength was not less than we expected to have. Also, we are not easier to see the metric kind of fractures in the practice nowadays compared to the previous data. Also, this design is easier to to draw because you will be you won't be limited by the tongue or the fibrinized lines locations. However, I want to remind you. So, in the clinic or in the daily practice, you may able to use this design very well. But in any exam, you should follow the previous slice instructions and not your daily practice rule. So if you in the exam you be asked what's the least desirable design for the major connector of the maxilla, you still need to choose the U-shaped parallel connectors. You shouldn't say because you are able to use in the clinic, so this one is desirable. That's not the correct answer to the questions. Okay, let's take a look at the other design, what we call the parallel plate. So. When we have a plate, you know this is over twelve millimeters width, and it looks like a uniform same metal plate over the whole tidal area. And because it was pretty thin, so it can provide some thermal conductivities, and can, patient can feel much better when the tongue touch this tidal plate area. Also, you can see in the front the the corrugations in the anatomy replicas add the strength to the casting. So when you finish the pietal plate, it can be finished more thinner than the other design. And when you place this pietal plate, the entry border should be follow the valleys between the loop area. And should not extend anterior to indirect retainer on the first premolar area, and the posterior border should be located at the junction of the hard and soft palate, and does not extend it onto the soft palate. So it means that the posterior border shouldn't be over the fibrating line. We also have a single palatal bar or the anterior posterior palatal bar. So, remember the bar is four to eight millimeters. The strap is eight to twelve millimeters. So bar is more thinner than the strap. However, when we want when we consider the rigidities, if you want to provide the same rigidity to the design, when you choose the bar, even it's thin, but we will need to increase more thickness. So we can provide the needed support and the stability. So when we increase the thickness, this design will be considered a little bit bulky to the others, strap or the plate design. So sometimes it will easier to interference with the tongue movements because when we talk or when we swallow, the tongue will be rise up to touch the parietal area. And when you have a bulky stuff over the palate, 
patient will feel a little bit difficult when they swallow or talking. We also have a complete palatal coverage. This one, the indication is that when the last remaining abdominal tooth on either side of the class one arch is a canine or the first premolar, then we will uh, likely to choose the complete palatal coverage. However, because we were gonna use more metals, so you will increase the cost. Also, because the palatal coverage plate that we are not easier to rely over the anterior area. So this design is uh, rarer to be used in the clinic. So if you review the KISS principle, you'll be present in the sim lab. Actually right now, the maxilla the most four common design you'll be used will be anterior posterior palatal strap, the U-shaped palatal design, which we call whole shoe type, or the single palatal plate, or the single palatal strap. For the mandible, the lingual bar and the lingual plate. If you choose those six designs, in most of the cases, over 90 to 95 percent of the cases you have in the clinic can be able to be solved. So after the major connector, let's take a look for the minor connector. So remember, the minor connector definition is to serve as a connecting link between the major connectors or the, the base of a removable partial dentures and the other component. So it's kind of like to provide a connection from the other component to the major connector or the denture base. The function is to transfer the functional stress to the abdomen tubes. Also, they can transfer the effect of a retainer rest or stabilizing component, which is the indirect retainer, throughout the prosthesis. So what's the requirements when we design an indirect retainer? You also need to be provide the sufficient rigid, rigidity. So the sufficient thickness is important. When we talk about the thickness for the indoor retainer, between the junction of the rest to the minor connector, we should have 1.5 millimeters thickness at the junction. That's why remember, when you prep the occlusal rest seat over the tooth, I said you should have at least 1.5 millimeters reductions from the marginal ridge, so you can provide the space to the minor connectors for the rigidities. Also, when you design an indirect retainer, oh, sorry, when you design the minor connectors, these minor connectors must not impinge on the marginal gingiva. So when you design uh, minor connectors, we have two requirements. One is that you should provide a sufficient rigidity. That means that you should have a sufficient thickness of the minor connector. So from the junction of a rest to the minor connector, you should be have 1.5 millimeter thickness at the junction. So that's why in the synapse, when you practice the occlusal rest seat preparations, I told you you should have at this 1.5 millimeters occlusal reductions from the marginal ridge. That's for the space for the minor connector. The second is about the design should not impinge on the marginal gingiva. So remember we said that the, all the connectors design should be a little bit away from the visual margins. On the maxilla is six millimeters, on the mandible is three to four millimeters. However, we also need to notify when we open the window of the framework, the mesial distal distance also very important. Here on the slide, it said, you should be located 
at this 5 mm from other minor connectors to permit the compatibilities and prevent the product accumulation of this area. So, you are not just only care about the bottom of the window to the free draw margin's distance. You also need to care about from the meso to the distal distance should be at least 5 mm or more. We also have two minor connector design will be discussed here. One is the tissue stop. So this tissue stop is a part of a minor connector's design for retention of a quick resin base. It can provide stability to the framework during the transfer or processing stage. It also can be used to prevent the distortion of a framework during the processing procedure. This also would be a tool to verify if we need the autocast technique. So this tissue stop basically is in the end of your RPD framework design. Also, we have a finish line. So the finish line, the definition is the junction between the major connector to the quick resins. As you can see in the pictures, the yellow arrows points out is the external finish line. So why we have finish line? So when we have a metal framework in some in the dentures area, we will set the tubes. So underneath the tubes, that's a denture base. However, the metal framework will still be embedded between the denture base material. So when it was embedded, it will create two junction lines. One is called external finish line. One is called internal finish line. The external finish line is the one that you can see on the framework outer side. And the internal finish line is the one you can see when you flip off your framework. And when we do the drawing or do the design on the cast, uh, you're being asked to draw the finish line in red, which is means that you draw the internal finish line locations over the cast. So when you design a finish line, you should know where is the proper location of it. Because if you place the finish line too medially, that you might change the natural contour of a palette or the artificial tooth locations. So what is the proper finish line locations? So first, look at the pictures. So just image from the missing tooth of the lingual surface. And then you can connect it as a imaginary line. And you put the finish line two millimeters medial from that imaginary line. So you can see on the left side, that's a correct design. However, on the right side, it was moved too medially and then it may change the natural contour of a palette. So that's incorrect. And remember, when you do the drawing project in the scene lab, I talk about you have two different drawing or two different design for the finish line. One is for the square U-shaped form. The second is about the vertical line next to the tubes. And the rule we just talked about is to use for the square U-shaped form. So when you put the square U-shaped form, you should connect it from the lingual surface of the tooth and then put it two millimeters medially. However, if you use a vertical line next to the tooth, you won't really need the principle we just discussed about.